the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. A social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. William Godwin as an Anarchist, Reinventing a Canonical Figure, by Jon Erik Hansson. Primers on anarchist theory, both in English and other languages, often include the late 18th and early 19th century writer William Godwin in their historical surveys of anarchist thought. They point to his 1793 inquiry concerning political justice and argue that Godwin's relentless critique of the state, of political institutions, of property, punishment, inequality, and domination in general are echoed throughout the anarchist tradition. And so they present him as a forerunner of anarchism, or as the first modern anarchist philosopher. But why does it matter whether or not Godwin was an anarchist? What does describing him as an anarchist, or as a certain kind of anarchist, allow authors to do or say? In other words, What are the ideological reasons that lie behind Godwin's description as an anarchist by later authors, both anarchist and non-anarchist? To answer these questions, I want to relate three stories, three moments of Godwin's redescription as an anarchist, spanning the entire 20th century. I'll start in 1910 in Britain, with Peter Kropotkin's entry on anarchism in the 11th edition of the Encyclopaedia Britannica. This is perhaps the first piece in English which explicitly ties together Godwin and anarchist communism. It is also a piece of writing that sought to circulate the main tenets of anarchism to a relatively broad audience of non-anarchists. Crossing the Atlantic, I'll then consider what Isaac Kramnik, a historian of political thought and a specialist of 18th century Britain, wrote to discredit Godwin and anarchists in the 1970s in the context of a surge in interest in anarchist theory and practice. Finally, returning to the UK in the present day, I'll look at how Godwin serves as an exemplar of a flawed tradition of classical anarchism in the post-anarchist thought of Saul Newman. By examining these three moments, what I want to do is show that the construction of a philosophical canon opens up and or forecloses ideological possibilities in the local contexts of the construction and reconstruction of that canon of thinkers. Peter Kropotkin arrived in London in 1886. At that point, he had been forced to leave Russia, Switzerland and France because of his anarchist political activities. Over the course of the 30 years he lived in Britain, Kropotkin sought to popularize anarchism, especially in radical circles. But his audience was broader than that. In the early 1900s, he was asked to write for a different audience, as he was commissioned to write the entry on anarchism for the 11th edition of the Encyclopaedia Britannica. Rather than radicals, Kropotkin thus addressed an interested, relatively educated, and broadly, though not exclusively, middle-class reading public. His entry on anarchism, then, is best understood as yet another attempt to translate anarchism to a different social and political context. The entry straddles activism and scholarship. It has four main aims. First, it presents a formal definition of anarchism, contrasting it with state socialism. Second, it provides a short historical overview of anti-authoritarian doctrines, from antiquity to the 19th century. Third, it develops a more thorough, transatlantic overview of 19th century anarchism and anarchist movements. Finally, in the conclusion, it shows, in Kropotkin's words, the penetration on the one hand of anarchist ideas into modern literature and the influence, on the other hand, which the libertarian ideas of the best contemporary writers have exercised upon the development of anarchism. Throughout the article, Kropotkin singles out moments at which British political traditions could be understood to be more or less anarchist. And thus enters William Godwin, a late 18th century English radical and novelist, the father of Mary Shelley and the father-in-law of Percy Bysshe Shelley. 
and the husband of early feminist writer Mary Wollstonecraft. Godwin is described as the first to formulate the political and economical conceptions of anarchist communism. And Kropotkin argues Godwin had much to offer. He offered a radical critique of the state, of laws and courts, of government and of property. He also offered a vision of an ideal, decentralized, autonomous, community-based political order. This is only the first instance of Kropotkin's attempt to inject a sense of Britishness in his presentation of anarchism. It is followed by a discussion of the British origins of mutualism in the 19th century, and it ends with a claim about the affinities and similarities between anarchism and all the intellectual movements of the mid to late 19th century in Britain. Drawing these links and grounding anarchism in British intellectual life is what allows Kropotkin to make anarchism acceptable and respectable, if not necessarily attractive, to a middle-class public. In this story, Godwin serves as a local, British point of origin for modern anarchism, highlighting its local rather than foreign roots. If identifying Godwin as an anarchist helped Kropotkin make anarchism local in Britain, Isaac Kramnik's negative depiction of Godwin as an anarchist advanced his own anti-anarchist political objectives. His description of Godwin as a typical anarchist in 1972 in the columns of the American Political Science Review allows him to condemn anarchism as utopian, elitist, and politically impotent. Kramnik attacks Godwin for his commitment to anti-politics, meaning Godwin's refusal to participate in organized mass politics. His elitism, and therefore the fundamentally undemocratic nature of his thought, and his utopianism, and therefore his inability to have any effect on the real world. After examining what he calls the theoretical repudiation of activism found in the Bible of Anarchism, Kramnik points to the godwin thelwell controversy of 1795 to illustrate his point. In 1795, bills known as Pitt and Grenville's Gagging Acts were passed. They severely curtailed the ability of radicals to circulate political tracts and hold political meetings. One of the government's main targets was John Thelwall, a radical orator, an agitator, and at the time, a friend of Godwin's. In response to the acts, Godwin wrote an anonymous pamphlet in which he condemned both the acts and Thelwall's activities, causing a falling out between the two friends. Based on a partial reading of Godwin's pamphlet, Focusing on his critique of Thelwall, rather than his condemnation of the acts, Cramning claims that Godwin was effectively defending the actions of the government. These considerations form the core of the attack on Godwin, and Godwin's flaws, according to Cramnick, are shared by most anarchists. Indeed, they are a feature of anarchism. For him, and this is a quote, Godwin stamped anarchism with its elitism, its abiding conviction that if only all men were as wise or as sensitive as the anarchist, then governments would be superfluous, and that until this was the case, government represented pure coercion. Worse, for Kramnik, Godwin in the 1790s, and this is a quote again, may well have marked anarchism with another indelible stamp, its ultimate service to the status quo, although latter-day anarchists may have been and are less willing in this service than he. This attack on anarchism went beyond the relatively confidential columns of the American Political Science Review. Kramnik revisited and recirculated most of these in the long introduction he wrote for the paperback Pelican edition of the Inquiry Concerning Political Justice, which came out in 1976. Here again, Godwin served as a stepping stone to discredit and dismiss anarchism as a whole. This was sorely needed, according to Kramnik, because of the resurgence of anarchism in the English-speaking world through the works and activities of people like Robert Paul Wolf, who published his short philosophical work in defense of anarchism in 1970, or people like Jerry Rubin, famous for his involvement in the Chicago 7 trial, and a representative of a counterculture which Kramnik saw as compromised by anarchism, or other people like Paul Goodman and Colin Ward, who Kramnik believed advocated an anarchistic localism that needed to be fought. In short, 
The resurgence of anarchism on the left in the late 1960s and early 1970s encouraged this specialist of 18th century political theory and political culture to take up his pen to describe anarchism as fundamentally impotent, anti-democratic and anti-political. It was not an ideology worth reviving. Despite Kramnik's best attempts, many did believe anarchism was worth reviving though it was also seen as in dire need of an update. From the 90s onwards, some philosophers and political theorists like Saul Newman and Todd May have sought to combine anarchism and post-structuralism to reformulate anarchist politics. Proponents of post-anarchism take issue with what they perceive is the enlightenment bedrock of anarchism. For Newman, in particular, what he calls classical anarchism relies on the belief in, for example, an absolute form of reason or justice that informs revolutionary theory and practice. Based on his reading of post-structuralist theories, Newman argues that those beliefs are grounded in presuppositions that can no longer be sustained. And so, in order to continue being relevant, anarchism must abandon them. To ground this argument historically, Newman refers to Godwin as a key thinker of classical anarchism, alongside Proudhon, Bakunin, and Kropotkin. Godwin allows Newman to root classical anarchism in the late 18th century, in the Age of Enlightenment, with that era's perceived emphasis on absolute rationality. In his 2010 The Politics of Post-Anarchism, Newman thus mobilizes Godwin as an exemplar of the rationalist foundations of classical anarchism, which helps him underline and orient his criticisms of the more familiar figures of Bakunin, Kropotkin, and Proudhon. According to Newman, Bakunin, Kropotkin, and Godwin all share an Enlightenment-based rationalist and humanist discourse that manifests in an understanding of social and political progress linked to the uncovering of natural laws through scientific discoveries. Placing Godwin between Bakunin and Kropotkin here and tying them together with the Enlightenment allows Newman to underplay the differences between the thoughts of these three thinkers, to emphasize their similarities, and therefore to reinvent or redescribe a classical anarchist tradition that he believes is fundamentally compromised by its Enlightenment roots. So what do these three case studies tell us? They tell us first that Godwin is a protean figure in anarchism. His thought can be invoked to ground anarchism in 18th century traditions that help make it respectable for a broad non-anarchist audience, discredit it from an unsympathetic perspective, or challenge it from a more sympathetic perspective. These case studies show us also that discussions and debates about individual thinkers in the anarchist canon do not necessarily have much to do with the thinkers themselves as much as they have to do with the dynamics of ideological reconfigurations and political debates inside and outside of anarchism. Peter Kropotkin sought to make a broad readership recognize anarchism as a respectable political ideology alongside the liberalism or Toryism that would have been more common to the readers of the Encyclopedia Britannica. It sought to put anarchism on the ideological map. By contrast, Isaac Kramnik tried to discredit anarchism and take it off the ideological map in the context of what he saw as its resurgence in the wake of social movements of the late 60s and early 70s. Instead, he argued in favor of ideologies more compatible with what he saw as mass political activity. Working from inside anarchism, Saul Newman sought to update its political language to make it theoretically valid in a world where meta-narratives no longer hold water. Godwin's position as an early thinker of anarchism gives his readers a certain flexibility in interpreting the arguments contained in the inquiry concerning political justice. They can thus mobilize him to build narratives that suit their own purposes. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? 
For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.